Mario, we're absolutely delighted to have you with us. Congratulations on your appointment to Director General. I think not a day too early. Well deserved. I've watched your career for many, many years, and it's gone in one direction, and I hope it will continue to do so. Um, and you've got this very important new role. I think this new position and, and the whole department was established under this commission, under the von der Leyen Commission. And I think we're quite keen to learn a little bit more about its role, its functioning, your expectations, and also in the light of COVID, as we've just talked about, you know, the coordination with member states has become so much more important. That was even unforeseen when the uh, when Commission President gave her uh, set out her principles. Her, her, uh, God, I nearly used the German word there, but anyway, her high-level principles um, on the priorities for this commission. So I'd be interested, Mario, just maybe give us a bit of a sense of your function, your role, and how you're settling in. Thank you very much, and very happily so, and thank you for the for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to get to speak about this. Um, let me make uh, one step back, not much, a few months ago in, uh, in February. I was invited in my, my alma mater in Bocconi University. So that was slightly before the pandemic. None knew that the pandemic would have come. And before I was appointed here as, uh, as Director General, and I was asked uh, the, I was asked to deliver a two-hour lecture on the topic, the general topic was uh, the EU economic policy. You cannot make it larger, probably. So they were kind to me, and they basically said, okay, speak about what you want. And uh, uh, the topic I chose was the changed and changing role of the European institution in the economic policy. And basically, my claim which uh, I don't know whether you all share it, but I do, I do think it's a major change, is that uh, progressively uh, from the previous crisis, we have been learning that uh, our classical role of uh, regulators, our classical roles of legislators, our classical roles of, let's say, adjusting uh, the supply side of the economy, um, it's, it's an excellent role, it's uh, decisive, it's fundamental. We have seen it to walk out uh, uh, from the banking crisis, but it, not, it may not be enough when you are faced with huge investment gaps. And uh, from 2015, the European institutions moved uh, discreetly but firmly into the area of bridging investment gaps with what I call, uh, and I always say publicly, the decentralized demand policy which was the Juncker plan, essentially. We put one part of public money, the, the rest of the private sector came with the remaining 15 parts. So in that sense, it's decentralized. We did the demand policy, but decentralized with the, the market test, economists would say. So with the market test, and, and we moved in that direction. And I think the Juncker plan was quite successful. Uh, the, I'm saying the Juncker plan, but all that was attached was quite successful in closing the investment gap. One thing we learned very well with the Juncker plan is that investment helps. Investment alone, however, may not be uh, fully efficient unless it is accompanied by reforms. And I think the lessons of the Juncker plan, the lessons out of the crisis of the Juncker plan have really helped us to understand the uh, intrinsic uh, intimate uh, relationship that there is between reforms and uh, successful investment. I think, uh, once again, the economists who are listening, uh, uh, they say, we know this. This is called total factor productivity. We have studied it when we were at university, which is true. But what I think we have done uh, at the Commission in the last few years is the attempt to go and exactly help member states to modify that uh, total factor productivity. And then um, what happened is that when uh, uh, our uh, current president arrived, Ursula von der Leyen, the, uh, she decided uh, to create two new services. One was the DG Defense, and uh, uh, the other was exactly the DG Reform, exactly to make sure that uh, it's given enough attention to, uh, to DG Reform to the reform in general. So it's given enough attention to the reform in general. 
Now here we have to be uh, we have to be clear because it's not the Commission that does the reforms for member states. I mean, member states need to do the reform themselves. There is no doubt on that. Um, and, and none is trying here to impose on anybody any possible uh, reform. So the issue is not doing the reform for someone else. The issue is helping member states' administration to design, develop, and implement reform. So in a way, someone said, in a way, we act a little bit as a, uh, as a super consultant that we help member states in several uh, in several aspects. The first aspect is the one to uh, be able to draw up a reform. What does it mean, a reform? Sometimes, uh, then I will explain a bit in detail how we work, what is our calendar, and so on and on. But like in many other, like in many other projects or plans uh, or, or programs of the Commission, there is a deadline by which there is a submission, and the submission of the member states sometimes is, uh, is is a submission of an idea of a reform, which then needs to be to be developed, to be spelled out. So to pass from the ideas to uh, what you may want to call in our jargon the term of reference of what a proper reform should be, should be or a, a detailed project description of what a proper reform should do. So that's the first area where we help, and the the second area where we help is basically to uh, try and bring together with us the best possible knowledge that uh, we could bring for doing this reform. In a way, uh, again, someone said we are a little bit like the, the ESM, you know, the Klaus Institution, European Stability Mechanism. What it does is that it goes on the financial markets, it borrows money at an advantageous rate and the passes to member states here it's uh, similar but we don't deal with money we deal with knowledge so we go on the knowledge market we not borrow but we pay for the knowledge and we transfer to to member states so basically what the jury fund does is first of all tailor-made totally tailor-made it all starts with a request from the member states so is uh, on demand that's why i said at the very beginning uh, uh, nobody is trying to impose anything on anybody. It, it is on demand from member states. They ask what they they feel they need. Often the demand, as I said, is is general, and we help them to precise the the demand. And then uh, once we have precise the demand and we have tailored the demand to the to the effective needs, we can go and. Uh, find the, the unique combination of expertise of the commission and, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the external consultants. We work both with international organization, OECD, IMF, and the alike, and with private consultants, uh, and uh, if the case is uh, also with universities, and so on and on. This is essential because it allows us to be very much hands on and concrete. The member states come to us with a precise reform example, like, for example, I don't know, we need better digitation, uh, digitalization of a given ministers. We go and we look at what are the obstacles to that uh, digitalization in terms of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, human infrastructure, user, for example, where, where are the, uh, by whom it is being used and how. And so this allows us to be very much hands on and concrete. One of the beauty of this product, uh, this program, is that uh, uh, there is uh, there is no money to member states. We don't give the money in the hands of the member states. We 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 basically help member states to to uh, fulfill a need that they have. But in order to do that, we we use the money with the provider, but we don't pass the money with uh, with member states. Interestingly enough, all member states are interested in that. Recently, I was asked for an event like that, what was uh, written on the on the papers by the Corriere della Sera, and then they made an interview out of that. And of course, they posed me the, the most typical Italian question, which is, uh, do also the German ask for it? And, uh, and the reply was, yes, of course, also the Germans, and every, every country asked for it. We have done in the last four years, 
uh, this, uh, when this was a service and before it became a, a DG, it has uh, done uh, about a thousand projects in uh, all the 27 member states. And uh, the, as I said, there is a deadline. The deadline was uh, last week, the 31st of October. That's why I have asked you to, to move a few days afterwards. So the deadline at the 31st of October, we received uh, in excess of 700, uh, 700 uh, requests from member states. Now, of course, uh, we are not able to, to satisfy to satisfy 700 requests, but that's uh, uh, the rule of the game in a way that allows us to to uh, to choose the the project which are best. And in a moment, I'll try to qualify what best means. And uh, but it allows us to choose those projects where we think we can uh, we can uh, we can truly make a difference. But also, if you have uh, 700 requests and let's say you can choose 200. It allows us to do something quite fundamental, which is uh, policy, because by making the choice, basically we help uh, the commission, that means all the RDGs, uh, to bring on the ground the different policies, because essentially we act in three areas, the area of uh, uh, planning, designing, developing and reforms, the area of uh, helping member states to adopt the European legislation or the area of helping member states to use uh, the uh, the European funds. And as, as we know now with the RRF, this takes it to, to even another uh, to even another dimension. Before I get to the uh, to the RRF, maybe uh, let me give you a few example uh, examples and, and feel free to to interrupt. Anybody should uh, should feel free to to interrupt uh, uh, in any moment. So, but uh, basically, the, we we work across uh, five broad policy areas, which are the first area is uh, uh, what we call in jargon PAG, policy and uh, public administration and governance, and that's the area where we are also the leading DG uh, of the Commission. So we we run the policy of public administration and governance, and we help member states to bring this policy down on the ground. Then we work in the second area, which is uh, revenue administration and public financial management. There, of course, we are not the policy leader. We are policy linked. So we help the DG who are mostly responsible, uh, ECFIN, TAXUD, and so on and on, to bring their policies down to the ground. The third area is uh, growth, which from the 16th of January will be, I guess, it, sustainable growth. As you know, we have a little Rechain a little change of the name, so it will be sustainable growth and business environment. And there again, of course, we help the policy link DG, DG Grow, DG Employment, and so on and on. The fourth area is labor market, education, health, and social services. And there, there are a number of DGs uh, which are which are working with us. And the fifth area, which is uh, uh, the one uh, we know most, of course, which is financial sector and access to finance, which is an area where we have uh, we have really worked a lot, both, for example, for helping member states uh, to bring down uh, legislation. I remember, for example, when I was on the other side in DG FISMA, having cooperated with this service, uh, for example, to bring the BRRD down to some to some member states, or uh, or we are helping, uh, for example, on improving various characteristics of the independent market authorities or or other aspects. So clearly, uh, the the remit, the extent of the areas where we work, is very large, uh, which uh, which per se is very good because it allows us to serve member states both when they want to uh, implement uh, union priorities and, uh, for example, CSR. Typically, we have always the discussion on there is a CSR, there is a country specific recommendation which has come in the European semester. Do you need any help to, to bring it down to the ground? But also if they want, for whatever reason, to push some national priorities uh, and, uh, and, they, and, and they can avail themselves of this uh, 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 instrument, of the instrument of the technical support. Now, uh, in the uh, super famous uh, council meeting of the 20th and 21st of uh, July, uh, the uh, the heads of state and government have decided to 
give it uh, to this program a, a major boost. Essentially, this was a program of four years uh, for about 200 million, and it has been boosted to a program of seven years for about 800 million. So the boost that has been given is, of course, an honor on the one side. On the other side, we we feel the weight of the of the responsibilities because lots is uh, is uh, is expected, and uh, lots is expected, especially now when we come with the with the major project uh, where someone calls it the Hamiltonian moment. If you look on the on the financing side or the Marshall moment, if you look on the on the expenditure side, but I mean, let's say on the on the RRF uh, uh, and therefore the possibility to have a um, to have a, a sizable amount of uh, of financial resources for uh, for investment and reforms. There, clearly, the emphasis on reform needs to be uh, needs to be underscored. And uh, uh, our our role for those of you, and I'm sure are many who read very carefully the Commission documents, if you look at the RRF uh, uh, guidelines, uh, you see very well that it has been indicated that those member states that uh, uh, wish to have technical support for the implementation of the RRF, they can come to us. It's important to understand that the RRF is a performance-based uh, program, it's not cost-based, so it is not like the uh, let's say the structural funds or the cohesion funds that we used to know is a completely different program. It's performance based, and uh, the the sentence of the of the council regulation says very clearly that the payments, the satisfaction of payment request, uh, is dependent upon satisfactory fulfillment of milestone and targets. So it's very clear that uh, there are milestone and targets that need first to be planned then they need to be achieved. And if they are achieved, there is uh, there is the payment. And if they are not achieved, or if there are any issues with the timely implementation, uh, the, 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 the G reform can, uh, can, can help. Or even if there are no problems, but member states proactively and in advance uh, ask, for, uh, ask for that. So um, this is, let's say, overall what we, what we do. Uh, if you want, I'm happy to go down to to some example in one or the other uh, in one or the other area, or I'm happy to uh, to open up to questions. I'm a bit in your hands, Nicolas, as you like. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, I think I might come back to your offer in a moment to one or two concrete examples, or maybe that comes out of the questions that have come in. And for participants, obviously, please use the Q and A <laughs> function if you want to ask further <laughs> questions. But I think you made a good. I mean, you made it very clear that this is technical assistance. This is kind of advisory technical assistance. Technical support. Also is, is I technical mean, one thing I guess an important point, and I assume, but I want to ask is uh, best practice, sharing of best practice. Because if you do 200 projects or your pre-runner has done 1,000 project, projects, you will have learned what works well, what doesn't work well. And yes, each country has specificities. But, but there must be an immense kind of economies of scale and learning. It'd be interesting how you share that, because is there a mechanism whereby you share that knowledge across member states beyond those that apply for specific uh, projects uh, mm -hmm. or initiatives? That would be my first question. And the second one maybe uh, is linked to what you said, sustainable mm -hmm. finance or, or sustainability, the greening of the economy. Now, I understand that in the selection of the projects out of the 700, you pick 200. Uh, A, there must be some kind of consideration given to policies. But also, I'd be interested to what extent the, the technical assistance you're giving, the projects you're picking, either are focused on reinforcing the sustainability agenda or the digital transformation agenda. Yep, on, on both questions. First of all, is we call it, uh, and the text calls it, technical support, and we prefer the terms uh, technical support to, to technical assistance, uh, not least because technical assistance was already a part of the, of the cohesion policy uh, and is with a different, uh, with a different philosophy. On, on your very first question, on the sharing, uh, technical support comes in many forms. The most obvious one is the one uh, that I have uh, that I've mentioned, of course, where we take an external consultant. 
but it may come also in other ways, uh, like, for example, um, reform letters so led by us, by our staff, exactly because, as you said, we have uh, learned uh, a lot in the past. We see that things can be uh, shared across uh, member states. Or it may come, for some areas, it may come from member states themselves. So there are uh, uh, sort of natural pairs of member states, and this allows member states also to be on uh, on both sides of the dividing line of the of the technical support. And uh, we have uh, a number of member states who have been helping another number of member states in different uh, in different areas. And uh, uh, so the, the the first point to understand is that. The technical support may come in in many forms, not only in the most obvious one, which is the one I've described. Uh, I've described first. The second, I think, you put the finger on uh, on a crucial issue, which is the the multi-country dimension of all of this. This is clearly something with which uh, we have been uh, we have been uh, interrogating ourselves from the very beginning of. Uh, the different uh, programs. So clearly, we have some some European uh, priorities. The, you mentioned the twin transition, the green, the digital, the health, uh, and very clear European priorities. The difficulty is that those European priorities need to be brought down in the ground through national means, through national administrations, through national business environment, through national investment, uh, through national investment possibilities, and so on and on. So there is always this, uh, I don't call it a trade-off, but there is clearly some tension between the fact that we have a general uh, European uh, program, and then we need to uh, transform it uh, into, a, um, into, a national, into a national plan. But it is exactly because of that that I think the the learning curve and the ability of member states to pass experience one another is quite uh, crucial. In the in the uh, technical support call that uh, that was just finished, the one I said we received uh, in excess of 700 requests, we indicated to member states to consider whether they uh, are interested in uh, in, in multi-country projects. And uh, uh, we have received uh, uh, several indications of that. And one thing we also want to do is, of course, to go back to member states and say, you ask this, another country ask this. And that's quite obvious because you are both responding to the same, uh, to the same uh, European, uh, European priority. And therefore, uh, things can be, can be put together. For example, one clear area uh, where, uh, where we have an overwhelming majority of countries asking for help was on green budgeting, for example. Another one was on the, on the just transition mechanism. It's important to understand that the, the technical support can be coupled, uh, can, be, uh, can accompany both those reforms which are financed by national money and those reforms that are financed by European money like, for example, the Just Transition Mechanism and the Just Transition Fund. And there we have been accompanying uh, uh, several member states, more than, more than half of the European member states, to develop their own uh, just, uh, just Transition Mechanism. So there is, uh, there is clearly this tension, but uh, often you can solve this tension by making uh, what we try to call scalable uh, programs. So, so we try to make things which are Scalable. Of course, uh, you shouldn't exaggerate because otherwise I would contradict myself when I told you that the first thing is that this is on demand and tailor made. So, but but clearly there is a, there is a, there is a tension, and uh, you know much of this when the member states ask us, each and every member state has a different way to consult with you, to consult with the private sector, to consult with the stakeholders. But all of them they do it basically. Uh, in different ways, but all of them, they do it. So um, when it comes to this, uh, it's clear that many of you raise uh, similar points to member states. So even if it's on demand from member states, and even if we need to do it tailored to their uh, uh, present characteristic, often the objectives are very similar. So in a way, I'd say you have European dimensions in the objectives and a little bit more 
national dimension in the in the means in the way to do because they they may be dependent on the situation you find on the ground in one country the administration is super efficient and super digital in the other it has done uh, uh, or it is doing a lower a slower transition to digitalization for example thank you i've got a few few other questions that have come in and i know we've got a few minutes left now can i keep you for maybe five extra minutes yeah for sure end. for sure yes i think a second set of questions is around the role of the private sector and you've just alluded to that because if I look at our own client base, we look at you know the importance of structural reforms in individual jurisdictions, and sometimes there are challenges around public procurement, administrative measures, not necessarily badly intended, but they do slow down the identification of projects and reforms. And so one question might be to what extent there can be kind of direct contact by the industry with you, or how should industry go about this, or pri the private sector, if they identify barriers uh, let's say in best Paris uh, in uh, structural elements that that could help uh, you know distribute funding or otherwise have access to EU funding. Uh, and the flip side to that is, you say you work with uh, universities, with international bodies, but also with consultancies or advisors. Now, a full consulting isn't one of those looking for that type of support, but a number of our clients might be. So, how do they engage with you when you kind of think of support? around some of these projects uh, that you've now identified. Okay. On the first question, I presume you are talking about uh, identifying a national obstacle to, uh, to, to good, uh, for example, distribution of funds or absorption of funds or spending of funds and so on and on. So uh, if you're talking about that, we, of course, uh, we interface with the national authorities. Every country has appointed uh, a coordinating uh, authority that's how it's called the coordinating authority in the vast majority of the country sits at the prime minister office uh, not in all countries but in the vast majority of the countries uh, sits at the prime minister office and i think the best way for you is to make your voice heard with the coordinating authority to indicate uh, where you see the structural where you see the structural uh, uh, bottleneck and, uh, and and make sure that the structural bottleneck is uh, is addressed. It may be addressed uh, with the need for a for a reform, in which case uh, often uh, the the coordinating authorities uh, they they clearly indicate that to us, or it may be addressed uh, through other through other national uh, through other national mechanisms. So these, I would say, uh, we insist a lot uh, on the need uh, for having a good. Uh, um, a good uh, stakeholders consultation with the national coordinating authorities, but we deal uh, in the request phase, in the request identification phase, we deal essentially with the public institutions for a simple reason that uh, uh, we then need, uh, once assume uh, we get a request for a reform, we work with the, uh, with the public institution, we work with the provider and they come to you uh, for the provider in a moment, we work with the provider, we do a good plan, we then go, do a, a good reform. Uh, that is excellent, but to be truly good, we need that the reform is brought down to the, to the terrain. And that is uh, up to the member states, so we really need the member states to, to do it. And uh, we really need uh, to have a member state that is committed. So the commitment of the member states is one of the, of the essential elements, and that's why we uh, we interface directly at the level of request with member states, but then once the request is accepted and we we go we go around. Normally, what we do is that we have a uh, number of uh, the the international organization have passed the pillar assessment uh, phase, so they are pillar assessed. Then we have uh, seven consultants, uh, seven groups uh, of consultants with whom with whom we work and often we tender out, we simply do a public procurement. So we tender out the, uh, the, uh, the, the request, uh, the, the precise details of the request, and we then uh, judge uh, the, the offers that come. And when we judge the offer that comes, we do it uh, DG reform, but we always involve the DGs uh, which are policy linked. 
so that we have a, a, a good judgment on the on the offers that we receive, uh, a good and, and very expert judgment of the offers that we that we receive. So these are essentially the ways. But then the crucial point to understand is that uh, when we go when we follow up, where probably there is a big difference. Uh, with respect to, to grants, that's why we do very little grants, we do much more public procurement and work with the international organization, is that we remain in the picture. Then it becomes a sort of triangle between us, the beneficiary member states, and the uh, and the provider. And an area that I'm trying to, to develop as much as possible is also the ex post evaluation. So making sure that this is, uh, is followed and, uh, and continued. I think that's actually good because also, by the way, and, and thank you, Mario, my team is telling me that we actually had agreed to speak into a quarter two. So uh, actually we have a little bit more time and I certainly don't want to rush this. Um, as we're on the Friday afternoon kind of not looking, but I think uh, that brings me actually to the ex post evaluation because I know there have been a thousand projects so far. You've talked about best practice and sharing best practice, but you know, I, I've been in these situations, and I can imagine also, and all with so much funding being available, that this beautiful carrot that sits behind you, I know you don't decide on it, but you help potentially member states and public authorities having access to it. Uh, there's a there could be a temptation to kind of go for projects that the jurisdiction always had planned, always wanted to do, and now rolls out without thinking about how it could be potentially done better or what structural reforms could be introduced. So I'd be interested to hear, I know it's early days maybe, but what ex post evaluation has taken place? And also when it comes to national implementation plans, which are being submitted on various objectives, like environmental objectives, to what extent you, you have a chance to look at those and see how your work has fed into those? Yeah. OK, first of all, on the knowledge dissemination on our website and on our portal, then member states are increasingly learning uh, to look at and, uh, and to use actually on our website and on our portal we have a, a good a good amount of example of things that have been done uh, uh, in the past in these or that member states the vast majority of what we do gets published uh, at the end of the day so uh, we have we have number of examples but it's interesting that you ask because actually during the during the trialogues so one point that uh, that was uh, clarified is that we will actually make a sort of a repository of the different projects that uh, that we have done so that people can look into that and get inspiration out of that and uh, and and see whether there are there are things that can be uh, that can be scaled up or simply transfer from one from one to the other count on the on the exposed evaluation of course uh, that is the, the, the you know the, the the proof of the padding is in the eating. So uh, what we uh, I think a good plan for a reform is a plan that gets implemented, and this is something on which we need to be very clear. But that's why the um, the commitment of member states is absolutely essential in the period that goes uh, between June and October. I, I normally do the rollout uh, to to member states, and uh, this year I've done it mostly digital, unfortunately. But I went basically to each and every member states, explaining and to the coordinating authorities, and also the coordinating authorities made sure there were the 20, 30, 40, 50 ministers uh, and uh, various authorities uh, interested. They were involved, and what I've done each and every single time was to highlight that uh, we are happy to bring. Uh, the knowledge for a reform, but then uh, a reform is only a reform if it gets if it gets done. So what we need is really the 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 fact that it is supported possibly by more than just one minister or one authority. That maybe is a reform that is shared by the by the government or by at least two or three ministers, and then that the commitment is a is a long term commitment. You know, reform. Uh, one thing we have learned already with the with the UR plan and with the difficulty to do the reforms is that a reform per se is a, is a characteristic that makes it uh, unpleasant to 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 some politicians is that it suffers of time inconsistency. The costs of the reform are normally very immediate, both the financial and the political costs, 
and the benefits are more uh, dispersed in time. They normally come uh, and they can be big, but uh, uh, I'm sure if we if we think a second, we all know in all our countries of uh, of reforms for which uh, the politicians have actually paid by by losing uh, by losing uh, their uh, their share of uh, of of consensus. Uh, but then the reform actually actually work well. So what we are trying to do is really to also try to help uh, member states go beyond the the, the time inconsistency of of reform and uh, and explaining it. I think this is uh, I think this is probably one of the biggest obstacles. That's why the commitment of the member states and the member states authorities to the reform is essential. And that's why I always say when we roll out the program, I say that. If we see at some point uh, after we have started and uh, we are in cooperation with the provider and we see that uh, the commitment of the authority evaporates, uh, we don't hesitate to, to cancel. And I have already had to cancel few projects, uh, uh, regrettably, of course, uh, is never pleasant. Uh, it's actually it's actually quite hard, but I do it uh, having in mind the other projects that I could not finance in the first phase. And then now I can come and finance, and uh, and uh, um, and they are very determined and uh, and committed to act. So I believe this is uh, um, this is something that we uh, we need to keep in mind. I mean, the, uh, we can do all the most beautiful plans we want, but the most beautiful plan is the one that gets down implemented. And when it gets down implemented, is a, is a great satisfaction. I mean, normally member states make lots of uh, Publicity on uh, on that, and we uh, we go to the to the member states. Recently, for example, we have done one in in Portugal on uh, on capital markets. We have done one in Spain on protection of costs uh, all over. I mean, the uh, again, if you look on our website, you see a high number of uh, of projects that have been concluded. Concluded meaning uh, then uh, the public administration has taken consequences of. Uh, of all the of all the knowledge that we brought to them. That I have one is you focus on the EU 27 member states, but when we look at some of the reform programs and some of the funding, including with InvestEU and so on and so forth, there's also the neighboring countries. So Eastern Europe, North Africa, Middle East, which are becoming important, are strategically important. Does your team also extend some of the supports to those regions or does that fall into another part of the commission? That was one question that came in. And from my side, actually, the one thing I would find interesting if you came back to some concrete examples, you've just mentioned Portugal and capital markets. And you know our main interest is financial services. And that's the fifth area of, of reform efforts that you mentioned. I'd be interested to hear some examples of what you've done in the area of financial services. Okay, on the on the neighboring countries, uh, uh, no, the the program is only for uh, for the European Union. This DG we have a responsibility for Cyprus, the whole of Ireland. Uh, so, but that is uh, the responsibility of the DG, not of the technical support program. But technical support to the neighboring countries is given essentially by the aid regulation i know it because the the uh, in 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 uh, in the whole of uh, in the whole of the island of cyprus uh, so including the northern part of cyprus that's uh, that's what we do on the uh, on the on the specific uh, uh, example uh, for example the one in uh, the one in in portugal that was a project uh, uh, with the uh, portuguese market authority to uh, facilitate the design of their uh, essentially of their modernization uh, we have done it with other countries for example on digitalization of the of the other authorities we have done it uh, uh, we have done a project in the uh, in the baltics uh, on the on the different uh, uh, infrastructure of the of the baltics uh, we we tend to work on those projects mostly with the with the IMF and with the and with the World Bank, uh, so it's uh, um, they are they are often they are specific, but they take inspiration from uh, most of the things we 
uh, my colleagues now and, and myself before, we used to deal in DG FISMA. For example, we have done, as I said, several projects on BRRD transposition, few projects on AML5 that, as you know, is not the simplest piece of legislation on AML5 uh, transposition. We have, uh, uh, I, I have seen now in the request uh, quite a good number of projects coming up from the recently adopted uh, Capital Markets Union Action Plan, uh, which follows, as you know, the Capital Markets Union High Level Forum, uh, where uh, David Wright, Thomas Wieser and the alike were there. So um, I think they, the, the inspiration for your sector, for the financial sector area, the inspiration is rarely national, although it may be national. As I said, I remember one country where we 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 did some work on the on the digitalization of the of the market authority. Uh, but mostly the inspiration is uh, from the from the European legislation and uh, the ability of bringing the the European legislation down to the down to the ground. No, thank you. It's nice that you mentioned David Wright because I know David is one of our attendees, so I, I know he'd be pleased to hear this and rightly so. But also the very first webinar we did, Mario was with Thomas Wiese, and <laughs> Thomas was, um, I think, fairly frank in questioning the EU's ultimate ability, uh, the EU institutions' ultimate ability to shape structural reforms in the member states. He said, you know. The funding will be there, but whether that really leads to the desired reforms over time, he was slightly cautious, which given he chaired uh, the Eurogroup Secretariat and, and uh, Council formations is slightly concerning or honest. So I think in that context, it's good to hear what you're doing. It's very good to hear the work you're doing and that you're reaching out and that you're spending this time with us today. I think do feel free if there's areas where we can contribute as an industry can contribute or as a forum to discuss these things in more detail. I think that would be a great pleasure. I think it would be very interesting to hear, as you say, around CMU and some of those issues, how there will be an uptake because I could see a big demand for technical hmm. support around that and, and broader integration. Maybe to finalize on one really small that, thing, which that, that that area for listen to you. Are there, what type of um, projects are you seeing in the area of the uh, digital um, single market? Because one of the big challenges we also face with our clients and across uh, the wider industry is cross-border capabilities in e-commerce, digital communication, e-identification. It's, it's, it's a, I think, the biggest barrier to the single market today. And so if we take that away from, move it away from financial services to yes. a higher level, Maybe you could give us, as a closing thought, just a few examples of what you've been doing in that area. Okay, in the in the financial service, I was speaking, but it was mute a moment. In the financial services, an area, for example, where we have been working a lot, and I presume the demand will explode, is the area of the green and blue bonds. As you know, the definition of the the green and blue bonds uh, uh, tend often to be national, if not local. Uh, which has, a, has an impact on the depthness of the market. Now, with the next generation EU and the, the, the financing side, uh, where the Commission has uh, uh, the intention to issue green bond itself, and therefore we will be designing a, a yield curve that essentially will do the market. My, uh, my imagination is that uh, we are likely to get lots of uh, in, uh, in that area. But then digital and digital single market. Now, the interesting thing is that what we see, first of all, I, I didn't think I would agree so much with Thomas Wieser on the difficulty to bring a reform on the ground. Now that uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing it uh, uh, day and night, uh, I really see that uh, he was like, like very often, he, he, he so farer than, than most of us. Uh, but there is uh, uh, one good thing. Uh, the good thing is that the, the two subjects of green and digital uh, tend to be very, uh, tend to be very um, pervasive in all parts of the society. In a way, if you want, and, uh, and we do respect to the financial area that we, that we like a lot, what the pandemic has told us is that 
There are many other areas where the digitalization can go and, and very fast, no? Because, okay, financial services, somehow we gave it for granted, even before the pandemic. I'm sure you didn't walk into your bank for the last two years, and me neither. But uh, that we didn't walk into a stadium to look at a football match, or that we didn't, uh, we didn't walk into a bar to have a coffee and we are having virtual coffee, or that uh, we didn't walk into a, a, a la commune, a demander un document et faire la file. Uh, all of that was less obvious. And so I would say the digitalization is very pervasive. And uh, uh, what we are seeing after and with the COVID it is a, a, an effort by unsuspected actors to try to get on the on the digital train. Um, there is a there is a study which I I, I, I was really an eye opener, a, a very recent study in Bruegel done by Andre Sapir, where he does a, a linear regression. So you could get simpler, right? So a very basic linear regression trying to uh, explain what are the factors that uh, uh, impacted most on the GDP loss following the pandemic. Now, he points uh, between 35% and 45% on the quality of the public administration. The quality of the public administration that he describes using a composite indicator of the World Bank. Uh, but most of it, what we have seen is that most of the public administration since the pandemic when they contacted us, what they said is that quality equal digital. And digital means both infrastructure, having or not having the computer in a very basic and physical way, having or not having a mobile telephone which has the digital functions, but also uh, skills, upskilling, because you may have all the computer and the mobile you want, but if people are not able to to interface with that or to use it, then, then you have a problem. So I would say the pervasiveness of the of the digital characteristic is, is really a lot. I think before the pandemic, we thought green was very pervasive and it still is a very pervasive and it basically touches a whole sector. You have green mobility, green housing, green budgeting, green everything. And now I think the pandemic has taught to many of us that also the digital is like that. And I have seen it, I mean, the, the request for digitalization that I've seen coming in the last few months from areas uh, that before you wouldn't even think they they would be interested is quite, uh, is quite interesting, it's quite amazing. Thank you so much, Mario. I think it was a fascinating 50 minutes. I could continue for a long time. I understand why your former alma mater asked you to give a two hour lecture. Uh, <laughs> And and we found it extremely interesting. I always enjoy speaking to you, and I, it's amazing how quickly you craft the issues again in your new role. As I say, hopefully we can come back to you at some stage. I wish you all the luck in the meantime in thank making you. this further success. And and really, it's an important role for Europe. So thank you and your team, and a lovely weekend when you get to it. And speak to you soon, Mario. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.